Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Wendy Rowe, President and CEO of Rosalind Franklin University of Medicine and Science. It is indeed my pleasure to welcome you to the fifth annual Women in Science in Healthcare Symposium. Under norm normal circumstances, I would be welcoming you at our North Chicago campus, but needless to say, we are li living through very unusual times. Still, our mission presses forward. In the centennial year of Dr. Rosalind Franklin's birthday, it's inspiring to remember how she and her generation continued to work, maintain focus, and accomplish great things during World War II and the Cold War that followed. This virtual WISH symposium honors that spirit of determination. Our commitment to advancing the cause of women in the biomedical sciences is unwavering, and I thank you for supporting that cause by joining us today. It is clear that the world needs all hands on deck during the COVID-19 crisis. It will continue to require innovation from the best and brightest minds on the planet, even after we emerge from the crisis. We must constantly support our female leader, scientists, and healthcare professionals and remain vigilant against any kind of bias. The objective of the WISH Symposium has always been to provide that support and the vigilance. You will hear today from a group of experts speaking about Dr. Franklin's historic contributions to science and the standard that she set for women following her path. First of all, let me introduce the first of all speakers, Rosalind S. Franklin, the niece and namesake of the late scientist and our trustee. Good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Rowe. What a year, what an honor to be here to celebrate the legacy of my aunt, Dr. Franklin, in this centennial year of her birth. This wonderful annual, now sadly virtual, gathering this year is co-chaired by Dr. Lise Elliott and Christine Burgess, with support from so many others who have contributed to bring it to life today. I'm grateful that they continue to commit their limited time to this important project that highlights the gender disparity issues that women contend with across the health and sciences arena and beyond. Today, we stand firm in our conviction that we will continue to be vigilant within our own university environment and help to focus on the underrepresentation of women in STEM and healthcare leadership more broadly. I'm particularly excited about the topic this year and the fascinating research of our keynote speaker, Dr. Robin Jensen. Preparing to introduce Dr. Jensen today made me reflect on how the use of language wields such power. And that power is apparent and pervasive in the retelling of my aunt's work surrounding the discovery of DNA. Language weaves a narrative and helps define the characters within it. Rosalind's true narrative took time to unfold because of the initial distortions made about her role and character in James Watson's acclaimed book, The Double Helix. It was only after an interval of several years and subsequent books, such as The Dark Lady of DNA by Brenda Maddox in 2002, that the revised narrative uncovered Rosalind's invaluable contribution towards the discovery of the structure of DNA and her persona as an indefatigable researcher and perfectionist in a profession and environment dominated by men. Today, owing to the power of the narrative, Rosalind now enjoys the global posthumous status as a distinguished scientist who exemplifies both talent, dedication, and an extraordinary work ethic. It is worth recalling what had to be overcome for Rosalind to reach the zenith in her legacy. The National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine issued a 2018 report detailing the prevalence of sexual harassment in university science. They cite that Dr. Franklin was the victim of one of the most well-known incidents of the particular kind of scientific, scientific disrespect the report calls gender harassment. Defined as disrespecting, demeaning, and deprecating women and their work, abilities, and accomplishments simply because they are women. It emphasizes that gender harassment is by far the most prevalent form of sexual harassment in academic science. I believe, I always believe that the best way to illustrate how Watson used this form of sexual harassment towards Rosalind and more broadly towards women in science and how it infected the minds of colleagues and those around her is to use his very own words. At the 2012 Euroscience Open Forum in Dublin of women in science, he said, I think having all these women around makes it more fun for the men, but they're probably less effective. And talking directly about my aunt, Rosalind, 
Watson says in the double helix, her belligerent moods interfered with Wilkins ability to maintain a dominant position that would allow him to think unhindered about DNA. For that reason, clearly Rosie had to go or be put in her place. The thought could not be avoided that the best home for a feminist was in another person's lab. His colleague, a friend of, and fellow Nobel Prize winner, a friend of Rosalind's, who was infected by Watson's views, Francis Crick, says in his 1993 book, Nobel Prize Women in Science, I'm afraid we always used to adopt, let's say, a, patroni a patronizing attitude towards her. So while I'm highlighting these quotes from Watson and Crick, it's not my intention to focus on them or their distortions, but more to emphasize our own need to pay attention to language, how it is used, and to discern for ourselves the accuracy of what we read and continuously endeavor to be thorough and critical in our own analysis and comprehension of retold events. This is personal for me and my family, and it took many books, films, friends, and family members over the years to bring the true character of Aunt Rosalind beyond the one-dimensional perspective that Watson portrayed. So words do matter. The narrative matters. We can see in the world around us today that the power of language and narrative can lead to profound events and outcomes. It is for us to be vigilant and critical of how we synthesize information to make sense of the world around us. I'm profoundly grateful that I'm given the opportunity to share my thoughts and to do my best to honor my brilliant late Aunt Rosalind in this her centennial year. And now, I'm very pleased to introduce our keynote speaker for today's symposium, Dr. Robin Jensen. Robin has an impressive resume with the innumerable published papers, honors, and awards, and is currently Professor of Communication at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. There, she teaches courses including the Rhetoric of Science, Strategic Feminist Communication, and Health Policy Rhetoric. A Montana native, Dr. Jensen completed all of her post-secondary education in the Midwest, including a PhD at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Her research spans many fascinating topics on health, science, sex, and gender in both historical and contemporary discourses, and has been widely recognized with awards and fellowships. Dr. Jensen has authored 37 academic articles and essays so several of them named top paper by national organizations in her field. She is also author of two books, the first titled Dirty Words, The Rhetoric of Public Sex Education, 1870 to 1924, which in 2015 won the National Communication Association's Distinguished Book Award for Health Communication. Her second book is on infertility, tracing the history of a transformative term, which in 2017 also won dis distinguished coveted awards. Most recently, Robin was awarded a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship to research her third book, presently titled The Sex in the Science, A History of Women Shaping the Direct Trajectory of Fertility Science. We are honored in this centennial year to welcome Robin to discuss another fascinating paper she published recently with members of her chemical rhetoric group. The paper analyzes the ways in which Rosalind Franklin and her work were described in the journal Nature in the years since her death. Discourse that positioned her just outside the bounds of elite science, perhaps not unlike many contemporaries female scientists. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Robin Jensen to present the keynote lecture for our fifth annual Rosalind Franklin University Women in Science and Healthcare Symposium. Thank you. Greetings. Thank you so much for having me here today to speak. Uh, I want to begin by thanking Rosalind S. Franklin for her introduction and for being here on behalf of her family as we celebrate what would have been her aunt's 100th year. I also want to thank, before starting, uh, Dr. Elise Elliott for inviting me to speak on this important occasion. And I want to thank Jay Mote and Nicole Olabari for their very fine logistical and technical support throughout this process. Um, I had hoped to make the trip to Rosalind Franklin University to give this talk, and I know that I will come visit one day, um, but for now, I am giving this talk in my basement with some questionable wallpaper, and you know, we'll just make it work like everyone else in the COVID era. Um, but I'm really excited to be here virtually and to be speaking about an issue that is so important. 
So my talk today is entitled Rosalind Franklin and Nature's Scientist and it deals with research that I did with a team of scholars at the University of Utah here in Salt Lake City in the Department of Communication and our team is called the Chemical Rhetoric Group. What we do for the most part is we study how science and issues of science are communicated to and with both expert and lay audiences. We tend to focus specifically on issues of chemistry and how chemistry is communicated to and with expert and non-expert audiences. And of course, Rosalind Franklin was a chemist, and so we came into contact with her story by doing some historical research on the history of chemistry. Um, and of course, we became really compelled and interested in her story, compelled by and interested in her story, um, because she made such important scientific contributions with her work in crystallography, and many of those contributions have gone under-recognized. In the process of reading about Rosalind Franklin and finding out more about her, what really started to interest um, my team was that stories told about her after she passed away in 1958 were circulating a lot, for one thing. So people were telling a lot of stories about Rosalind Franklin. And then they seemed to be telling them in a way that offered a story about what science is and who can be a scientist and who can be an elite scientist. Um, so we started thinking about professionalization and what that might mean for scientists and women scientists in particular. Um, and that's where this research really set off. So with that in mind, um, I will begin talking about some of our findings and what we are up to. When you think about the study of science and health communication, there are a lot of different directions that can go, as you might imagine. But one enduring question across subfields of science and health communication is the question of why women and other members of traditionally marginalized groups are still so underrepresented almost across the board in science and medicine. And there are a number of different ways that different types of scholars could study this. Um, but as scholars of communication, we're very interested in messages and talk and speeches and newspaper articles. How do people make arguments about different topics? So one way that arguments are made in society is through representation. Different representations that we see in the media of how something really is um, gives, teaches us about what that thing is. The same is true for science. So how we learn what a scientist is, is often how we see scientists represented um, in different contexts, with the understanding that that then teaches us who can be a scientist. So that being said, we study often, scholars of communication and health communication, representations of science and health in various media. In this context, people have looked at how women in science and medicine have been portrayed in uh, their field's disciplinary history. So this is more of a technical study of how scientists within any one field, let's say biochemistry or genetic science, have communicated about the women scientists in their official records, um, which tells us a lot about the technical um, professionalization of scientists. People have also looked at broader scientific communities, so how interdisciplinary avenues allow people to talk about who's, who is included in the scientific sphere, who is scientific and who is not. Um, and so this might be something like an interdisciplinary journal, such as Nature or Science, um, and how those journals represent specific scientists um, and how they don't represent other scientists or how they represent them as non-scientists. And then um, many people have looked at, although there's much work that needs to be done, mainstream media and public discourse accounts 
of women and um, members of marginalized groups in the media and in things like television shows, newspaper articles, um, presidential address, you name it, blogs, music videos. How are the, I mean, I have yet to see a music video <laughs> based on scientists and women scientists in particular, but maybe that's the next best thing. Um, if there was one, that would give us all a sense of maybe what a scientist is. So I'll be on the lookout for that in the future. So what did our research do? In this case, we focused on the second area, the broader scientific community. And we wanted to look at that because in when scientists are talking to each other in an interdisciplinary forum, um, we can learn a lot about how they're professionalized to reproduce the norms of what is expected. So, you know, when you look at this area of representation, you can learn a lot about socialization within science. And so that's what we sort of set out to do with this project and in this way to study the really subtle discursive mechanisms of exclusion and inclusion. So our research, as you might expect, um, depends on me mapping out a story that many of you are intimately familiar with, probably way more familiar than I am. Um, so uh, bear with me as I give you a really brief version of the story of Rosalind Franklin and DNA um, that you all know so well. But before crystallographer Rosalind Franklin died of ovarian cancer in 1958, at the age of just 37, she did not know that Jim Watson and Francis Crick's model of DNA's double helix was based on their having gained illicit access to her own hard-earned scientific data, specifically her famous X, her now famous X-ray diffraction image, Photo 51, which is featured throughout the imagery for Rosalind Franklin University, and um, the original is reproduced here, along with um, the signature of Raymond Gosling, who was Rosalind Franklin's graduate student at King's College London, or King's College, um, who helped her to take the photograph in question. Nor did she know that they, along with her lab partner, Maurice Wilkins, who was the individual who leaked the data to Watson and Crick, um, that they would go on to be awarded the Nobel Prize for molecular modeling in 1962 so four years after she passed away. What Franklin did know when she died was that despite orchestrating what her obituary would go on to describe as the most beautiful x-ray photographs of any substance ever taken, she had been banished from working in the King's College London Medical Research Council unit and informed that she was never to work on DNA again. She knew that after two years of diligently working unrelentingly at King's where, as a woman, she was prohibited from dining in the senior common room or entering the pub where her male colleagues met to discuss their findings, she had been deemed a vector for drama, which some have argued is a euphemistic charge that has much to do with stereotypes surrounding single women um, and Jewish women. And she had been barred from the community of scientists that her contributions had ultimately helped to transform. She also knew, however, that despite all of this, she had used what turned out to be the last years of her life to begin anew and to make breakthroughs in virology, which is an area that is very important. It was important then and remains important today in the present moment. Thereby, she established not only her importance in the scientific record, but also her scientific acumen and her willingness to go and be above and beyond 
uh, to contribute to scientific knowledge. Given the lack of scientific recognition that she received when she was alive, I think it's safe to say that Franklin wouldn't have anticipated that following Crick, Watson, and Wilkins' Nobel Prize win, Nature, the prestigious interdisciplinary journal that originally published uh, the double helix model in 1953 and attributed that model to Watson and Crick, you can see an image of, of the cover of that journal, would go on to publish a host of feature articles, commentary, reviews, opinion pieces, and more that were focused on her. Um, they were ultimately, these pieces were memorializing her career and discussing why she did not receive credit for the data upon which Watson and Crick's model was based. So even though she did not receive credit at the time, um, there was lots of communication about why that was the case after she was gone, which tells me that her story was used in a professional sense to communicate something to the broader community of scientists. So it is these posthumous accounts of Franklin published in what many would consider to be the premier academic journal of the last century that I want to discuss today and how these publications worked to reconcile the theft of Franklin's data with the widespread celebration in the scientific community of the discovery of DNA's double helix. My co-authors and I argue, ultimately, that Nature's posthumous publications about Franklin communicated what a quote-unquote scientist is to its many readers through the contrast case of Rosalind Franklin. What that means is they situated Franklin and her work as just outside the borders of elite science and thereby creating a barrier with her story for where elite science stops and where something else less technical, more mundane begins. Her story and her work and her um, experience as a scientist functions as a communicative border for future generations of scientists to understand what science is and how you become a part of it. So our conclusions, which if you don't believe me at this point, that is okay. Um, we're gonna go into some of our data that gives some backing um, to these claims. Our conclusions are based on a close rhetorical analysis of the 68 nature publications discussing Franklin and DNA that were published from 1958 when she passed away, the first one is actually her obituary, until 2015, which at the time of the analysis was the last article in Nature published about Franklin and DNA. And these include 22 reviews, 12 commentary, um, nine feature articles, eight short reports, five editorials, eight letters to the editor, and four obituaries. I had to switch it up to just make sure um, that you were still listening. <laughs> so one thing that you'll note about these pieces is that none of them are technical scientific reports. They're not providing us with generally new scientific information from a unique study. Instead, they're providing commentary, for the most part, that socializes readers about um, the broader scientific community and specific elements of that community. So these pieces, we argue, really offer us a window into how scientists learn and uphold the norms of the broader scientific community. And these pieces also provide us with some insight into why efforts to promote inclusivity in the STEM disciplines have proven to be less than successful, even though there have been lots of efforts to create um, inclusivity initiatives. 
So we're thinking that maybe there are more subtle ways that the norms of science as something that is masculine, um, something that is white, um, are getting communicated. So we look to the stories about Rosalind Franklin in nature from 1958 to 2015 to get a sense of that and see what's going on. So one thing you might be wondering about is what is rhetorical analysis of data? Um, and I've tried to sort of bring that process to life by giving you some pictures of my research team as we engaged and went through this data using a rhetorical analytic method. And these are some of my co-authors, um, Benjamin Mann, uh, you see Melissa Parks down in the corner holding up our sign of different themes, uh, Madison Crawl, Courtney Mazon. We work together as a group to go through all 68 articles. Um, rhetorical analysis in a nutshell is a process by which scholars really focus on the symbolism in different kinds of communication, how messages are um, functioning in different ways in society to promote different kinds of communities, um, to persuade, to inform, all of the different things that communication does at both the micro and the macro level. So we have some different, um, different disciplinary mechanisms to go through that process. In the case at hand, um, my co-authors and I went through all of the pieces. We did so individually, so as five different people, and then we came together as a group and went back and forth through this process um, we had a writing retreat where we did this uh, straight for a couple of days and then we followed that up with more analysis after the fact. We went and looked through the, the data, these stories, these publications, looking for things like overarching storyline, focus of the articles, mention of Rosalind Franklin, key messages, types of images, there were lots of interesting visual um, elements of these stories and we started out with many more articles uh, but we widowed it down to the ones where Rosalind Franklin and DNA were the central element of the storyline. They weren't sort of in passing or it wasn't an advertisement or something along those lines. So in these scenes I hope you <laughs> can get at least the feel for the collaborative nature of this process and also the rigor with which uh, we took this process and its findings to heart. So we really worked to make sure that we were providing a sense of what was going on here that was fair and consistent across these many years and across these many different kinds of articles and publications. And we had a lot of fun in the process as well. Um, when you have five people on a team working together like that, you can play devil's advocate and make sure that you're not drawing conclusions that other people don't also see as playing out in that format. So one thing that we realized while we were going through these many articles is that the nature pieces provided a relatively consistent story despite their diversity in terms of where they came from and what they were up to that seemed to socialize readers professionally and get them to about the same pr place across the board, uh, but through different, um, different modes. So these stories involved what scholars of communication and sociology call boundary work. Um, and that's sort of a uh, conceptually broad term that discusses communication that in both subtle and explicit ways seeks to establish the boundaries of where science stops and the rest of the world takes up. Um, so it's all about the negotiation of what is truly science and what is mundane, what is not technical. Um, and then there's a lot of sort of in between and so boundary work really works to communicate to people what is scientific and what is not scientific. So that seemed to be going on in these articles. They were playing out a lot of boundary work by communicating about Rosalind Franklin, communicating about who is a scientist and speaking about Rosalind Franklin's case 
in ways that ultimately positioned her as outside the bounds of elite science. Um, thinking about and talking about what it means to be um, an elite scientist, so what are the values and what are the goals of elite science, scientists? Do scientists um, value awards or do they value the public good? And what does that mean? So these kinds of things were on the table in this conversation. Ultimately, it, it seemed to us that Rosalind Franklin was narrativized across these pieces in ways that designated her as a marker at the bounds of elite science. Um, and so there were three major ways that we saw this playing out, the way that that mode of boundary work was, was happening in these articles. And they, I'm going to discuss those in turn. They have to do with the genre, arguments about um, generic communication, the communication of specific types of scientific values, and also argument from dissociation. Um, either dissociating or associating Rosalind Franklin with science and outside of science. So the first mode of boundary work that we found playing out um, across these articles was probably the most compelling um, because it included a dramatic framing. We noted right away that ac almost across the board of these 68 articles, they were defying sort of the generic norms of technical science reporting, which is using uh, impersonal voice, not giving personal details, objectifying things, um, separating the speaker or the writer from the communication, um, and, and really trying to provide a sort of unbiased account. The opposite was true for these articles, where Franklin's situation was framed uh, time and time again as a drama. Um, and, and this is not just metaphorical, they literally stated um, that this situation had protagonists, characters, players, and in one case they even gave us a handy cast list for all of the different characters in this drama. Um, in the process, Franklin took on different roles. Um, she wasn't always the same. Uh, in some cases, she was uh, considered a witch. In others, she was upheld as a wronged heroine. And still others, more contemporary pieces, she was sometimes upheld as a, um, as a feminist icon, which is really interesting because she never would have um, positioned herself in that way, which is something that Rosalind S. Franklin told me when we met together and it's also evident in a lot of her other materials about her that exist today. So these stories, it should be reiterated, are not necessarily based on material or empirical fact. They're based on the stories that we want to tell about science to perpetuate existing community norms and maybe even to warrant past decisions, such as celebrating a renowned scientific, scientific discovery that uh, is based upon stolen data. So in one casting, in the first, Franklin was introduced as Rosie, a witch-like character, and in some cases she was literally called a witch. Um, Rosie, it should be noted, is a name that she never used herself, and none of her friends or close colleagues ever used that title. So it was a name given to her first by Jim Watson, James Watson, in his infamous 1968 memoir, The Double Helix, that I know many of you are familiar with. It makes for interesting reading. Therein he describes Rosie as a jealous, prudish, um, annoyingly sort of shrew-like figure who didn't want to work with anyone else and had the potential for violence. There's a point when he talks about how he was scared that she was going to hit him. Um, and this figure, although it was not mentioned, this first reference was not in the nature coverage. It was reiterated in a lot of the nature coverage. For instance, uh, in Maurice Wilkins' 2004 nature obituary, 
Um, there's a clear example of this type of characterization, which is quite unique to see something like this in an obituary. So the obituary reads, and I quote, Wilkins's laborious progress toward the structure of DNA was rudely disturbed by the arrival at King's of Rosalind Franklin, who cruelly elbowed him out of his cherished project and intimidated him away from solving the double helix puzzle." Unquote. Here and elsewhere, Franklin was said to have orchestrated and therefore polluted the work of genuine scientists like Wilkins. Wilkins, who was in it, according to this framing, for the greater scientific good rather than awards, whereas Rosalind Franklin was in it for the awards and recognition. Um, the storyline here is also interesting because Wilkins was given uh, the Nobel Prize, even though he wasn't part of the research team that was being recognized. Um, so there's a little bit of a um, trying to explain how that happened and why Rosalind Franklin wasn't included. Part of that has to do with um, the Nobel Prize going to people who are still living. And of course, Rosalind wasn't living in 1962. Um, even in cases where Franklin was upheld, not as a witch, but as, for instance, a wronged heroine or um, a feminist icon, authors were obviously trying to champion her inclusion in the historical record of genetic scientists and say this is a person that we need to be recognizing what she brought to the table. However, because of the dramatic framing that was being used, um, it was never her scientific uh, contributions that were at the heart of the story. It was always other elements of the drama, her looks, her jealousy, her being sp spurned, um, those kinds of things. So their writings worked largely against this goal by repeatedly downplaying discussion of her actual scientific crystallographic analysis. Um, the framing of Franklin as, for instance, as you, you can see here on this cover, quote, the dark lady of DNA, as Brenda Maddox famously called her in her book and then in two subsequent um, uh, pieces in Nature that were published in Nature, this positioned her, this label, as, as a heroine, as um, a person who is, you know, part of a romance, as opposed to a person who was sitting in a laboratory and looking through a microscope. Uh, and so these ideas that were meant to uphold her legacy as a scientist actually did the opposite, is something that, that we found. So beyond uh, the generic disturbance um, in these pieces, in that they defy generic norms, uh, there was also uh, a celebration of specific types of values that make a scientist that are kind of unanticipated. So when you think about um, what a scientist is known for in terms of their characteristics, you often think of um, exactitude, perhaps, and these are just stereotypes lack of bias, um, willingness to stick to something, determination, um, dedication to data. But in these cases, the pieces held up science as a place where intuition and collaboration are the ultimate values demonstrating, um, demonstrating membership. And then they repeatedly show how Rosalind Franklin does not have these values. Um, so even though it should be noted that uh, women are often uh, associated with values such as intuition and collaboration, in this case, Rosalind Franklin was often discussed as not willing to um, see beyond the empirical data she had in front of her, unwilling to make him leaps in her thinking, um, being so dedicated to the data and getting hard facts before moving on that she was unwilling to make the kinds of scientific leaps that were necessary um, to figure out the structure of DNA. At the same time, people often talked about how she was isolationist and unwilling to work with people, 
Uh, while science depends in these stories upon collaboration with others, as you see here between um, uh, Watson and Crick, and then the bottom picture is one of them receiving their Nobel Prize, Rosalind Franklin is featured in a conference um, in the upper picture. Uh, she is part of the group, but you could read that in various ways that she's looking quite serious while others are having a little lighthearted moment. So, so she might be sort of isolated in this picture of collaboration, which kind of reiterates that point. So in this case, uh, there were many instances where they positioned Rosalind Franklin as a person who was not intuitive and not collaborative and therefore not a scientist. For instance, um, in a 2006 book review, Horace Freeland Judson explained when Wilkins quote unquote, um, and he's talking about this moment when Wilkins slipped the data or took Rosalind Franklin's data out of her drawer and showed it to Watson um, without her knowledge. So he says, Quote, when Wilkins returned and expected to collaborate with Franklin, she shut him out. He grumbled about her to Crick and Watson. In February 1953, he notoriously showed Watson an X-ray diagram she had obtained, which they interpreted as she had failed to do. Unquote. Here you see first that Franklin isolated herself. She, people wanted to talk with her and, and work with her and find out more about her data, and she refused to collaborate. So you see that lack of collaboration. Perhaps more damningly, uh, at the end is the implication that she was incapable of figuring out what to do with this data. So not only did she hold on to the data and not figure it out. She then kept it from other people who could have figured out the data. So in this respect, she was not only holding herself back, she was holding back the entire field of genetic science and potentially the world in terms of the implications. Um, and so there's a sense here that she was not behaving scientifically. She was not inherently a scientist because of these, this lack of intuition and collaboration. Um, Judson in particular makes especially clear that he believes that she was not an example of scientific excellence according to the values of um, scientific criteria at hand. Thirdly, uh, the third mode of boundary making and boundary drawing in this context um, is one that is especially historically weighty and sort of complicated, but we'll do our best to, to give you an overview of what we sort of found happening. So the nature pieces under analysis represented Franklin's specialty, which is crystallography, as more of a superficial art than a serious scientific engagement. Um, in this way, they effectively disassociated or dissociated her work from that of the internal cognitive effort involved in technical science. So although they said she's not intuitive, she's not collaborative, so she can't be scientific, they also said um, crystallography is sort of artistic and inherently feminine, and in this way, she also can't be part of the scientific elite uh, because she's not really doing what she do, what we do. She's doing something else. Um, and there's a historical precedent to this where crystallography has been understood as uh, usually led by a male scientist who hires many women to do sort of the grunt work and the women are supposed to be doing mindless tasks. And this is actually entirely uh, a stereotype as if you uh, count out empirically how many how many men and women are in crystallography there's far more men than women and none of them are doing grunt work that is mindless um, but they're playing off of the stereotype in this representation so frequently her research data is described in terms of its beauty and its enchanting qualities when i began this talk i talked about how in her nature obituary 
they described her photo 51 as, as beautiful. One of the, among the most beautifully, um, beautiful x-ray photographs of any substance ever taken. Uh, and then they later go on to say a rather strange phrase, which is that it emerges from Franklin's beautifully executed researches that the research itself was beautiful in some way. Um, we wanted to find out if this was unique. And so we looked through all of the articles to see if there was anyone else's research who, that was described in this way. And no one else's research was described as beautiful or uh, spectacular in, in the same respect. In some cases, Franklin's appearance then is discussed in a similar way. How she looks, um, her uh, plain clothes or her beautiful face, um, and she's thereby conflated with her data as a subject rather than an object of scientific inquiry. Rather than a scientific actor in her own right, she becomes the thing that scientists are looking at. She's outside the bounds of unique of elite scientists because she is the spectacle. She is a woman in science. Um, so let me show you a representation. You're looking at it right now of this argument, a visual play on this conflation of Rosalind Franklin's beautiful crystallographic data and her appearance as beautiful and therefore non-scientific. So in a short report from 2000, this artwork piece that you see was featured and therein Franklin's photograph is juxtaposed over her renowned crystallographic x-ray diffraction image. Um, in this representation as you can see the similarities between the symmetry of the image and the symmetry of her face are sort of enhanced. She has her chin turned down so that the curve of her head aligns with the photo, uh, with the outline of photo 51. She is looking at us through the center of photo 51. Her eye is there. Um, she's a woman in science. She looks out at nature readers through her data. And in this way, she, she perhaps seems to invite them to consider her more as a spectacle than as an intellect. Um, and and in this way, she is positioned as outside the bounds of, if not elite science, all of science. So what does all of this tell us about Rosalind Franklin, the scientist, who spent her short life dedicated to crystallographic analysis and made breakthroughs not only in genetic science, but also in the study of coal? and the study of viruses. Honestly and sadly, not very much. But that's the point. What it does tell us is that the stories that we circulate within professional communities of scientists and medical practitioners is that these stories function in subtle but powerful ways to define those communities. And they may or may not have all that much to do with the individuals who are at the heart of those stories. So in this respect, part of Rosalind Franklin's legacy is a call to attend to these narratives about her and those like her and consider what they teach their readers about the scientific enterprise as a whole. We have a responsibility to understand how these stories are functioning communicatively at the level of professionalization and socialization. And that piece of the puzzle is central to our lack of success in making the STEM disciplines more inclusive. In, uh, the good news here, at least, uh, is that, so, so what, does, what do these stories tell? This is not the good news. <laughs> the bad news is, um, what do these stories teach us about women in science? They teach us that women are not all that suited to scientific endeavors, at least at the elite le level. They teach us that it does not pay to put them in charge of a scientific lab and that they are simply too striking and spectacular to be included within science's boundaries. That being said, the good news 
is that changing these types of narratives can happen. And with such changes, I've gotten behind here, with such changes, you will also see a change in terms of who aspires to be scientists and who feels accepted as a scientist in the years to come. Boundary work is an ongoing process that can change when we speak in different ways. So in Franklin's case, furthermore, something we must remember is that her dynamic, her work was dynamic um, and robust. And that the story of Photo 51 and her work, two years of work at King's College is just a small part of her scientific impact. She did outstanding and influential work in topics such as studying viruses, which is at the top of our list of important things right now. Um, I wish that she was still here to help us come up with a vaccine for COVID-19. We must remember her for the scientist that she was, as opposed to the stories about her that served to warrant her exclusion. If you're interested in more detail and more evidence for our claims, I invite you to um, seek out, you feel free to contact me and I can send you this article that we published in the Quarterly Journal of Speech. I wanna thank my co-authors, Melissa M. Parks, um, Benjamin Mann, Courtney Mazon and Madison A. Crawl for all of their hard work in making this research um, into what it, it is. And with that, I'd like to open this up for questions and panels to follow. And I really thank you for your attention and for the opportunity to speak today. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. My name is Dr. Heather Kankebel, and I have the unique honor today to facilitate this upcoming panel discussion. Um, but before we get started, I want to thank Dr. Jensen again for her very informative um, keynote that I thoroughly enjoyed, as well as others did in the audience based on the numerous comments. Um, please note that we will be addressing um, Q&A at the end of the panelists' questions. Um, again, I'm excited because Dr. Jensen will be joining us, um, as well as the panelists. Um, I'm going to read a brief, brief bio for each of our other panelists, and then they will talk more about themselves at, at length. Our first panelist is Dr. Chatterjee, and she joined Rosalind Franklin University in April 2020 as the Dean of the Chicago Medical School and Vice President for Medical Affairs. For the previous seven years, she served as Professor and Chair of the Department of Pediatrics at, and Senior Associate Dean for Faculty Development at the University of South Dakota Sanford School of Medicine in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. She has spent nearly 12 years as a leader in faculty affairs, faculty development, initially at Creighton University School of Medicine and later at the University of South Dakota. Welcome Dean Chatterjee. Our next panelist is Dr. Travis. She, and she is the Associate Vice President of Women and Minority Faculty Inclusion and Maddie Allen Fair Professor in Cancer Research in the Departments of Experimental Radiation, Oncology, and Pulmonary Medicine at the University of Texas, MD Anderson Cancer Center. As an Associate Vice President for Women Faculty, Dr. Travis is a consummate advocate for women and minority faculty and committed to furthering their academic careers by, en by ensuring they are appointed to high profile committees and leadership positions and are nominated for awards by leading institutional policy of change to address obstacles and that interfere with their success and by provoking career guidance and countless women and minority faculty. Welcome, Dr. Travis. And our other panelist, Dr. Loberg, has 20 years of experience in drug development as a toxicologist and project manager in the biopharmaceutical industry. Dr. Loberg's current role is scientific director in an, an emerging therapeutic platform group. In this role, she manages teams in preclinical safety, drug metabolism, and pharmacokinetics process chemistry and formula, formulations development in advanced novel technical platforms 
from discovery to development in oncology, immunology, and neuroscience. Welcome, Dr. Loberg. I would like to ask, start with a question for Dr. Jensen. What would you say is the lesson in Rosalind Franklin's treatment for women today in STEM and healthcare professions? And then a follow oh. No, great, great question. Um, so I think one of the lessons is that uh, we have to think about the stories that we tell about ourselves um, in a really concrete way, maybe a way that other people don't, um, who have more uh, expected positionalities. So um, people who are men, people who are come from a sort of specific background that's maybe more upper class and more um, white. Uh, those folks can kind of let this story sometimes be told for them. Um, but oftentimes women in science have to create their own story and sort of perpetuate that in a way that's really explicit and, and often feels counterintuitive to doing the work of science and doing the work of medicine. Um, so I think one thing that's important to draw from this is that um, there is this self-promotion aspect that has to happen because if you don't tell your story, um, other people will tell your story. And that is in no way to say that Rosalind Franklin should have spoken differently or done different things. She, her case is unique because uh, she passed away so early, so she really had no way to tell her story. Um, and, and others told it in a way that then justified really negative behaviors. Thank you. I think that's an excellent segue for our panelists now to start sharing their stories and really giving us some insight into their contributions to both science and healthcare. So Dr. Chatterjee, would you mind um, sharing your story and your introduction? Thank you very much, Heather, and many thanks to the organizers of the symposium today. Thank you, Dr. Jensen, for that wonderful talk that we all enjoyed. Um, for my story, I'm going to start with being born uh, with the misfortune of being the third daughter uh, in a culture uh, in India where uh, being a daughter, unfortunately, even today is considered uh, a curse and not a blessing. And uh, so there is much more I could say about that, but I'll start there. I give the credit to my parents for uh, supporting all three daughters to pursue careers in medicine. So my, both my older sisters are physicians as well. And uh, having the support really from the family uh, to pursue our goals. Um, my career in, in science came about uh, through the intervention of two women. My oldest sister, who by this time was at the University of Nebraska Medical Center in a graduate program and encouraged me to apply to the same program. And um, my uh, mentor and advisor, uh, Dr. Pat Lucian, who took on a uh, graduate student from 10,000 miles away, sight unseen uh, in, in those days, uh, and really encouraged and, and um, promoted uh, me through the time that I was a graduate student, and then actually encouraged me to return to clinical medicine and can complete my residency in pediatrics and my fellowship in infectious diseases. I went on to have um, several other mentors who were men, who were great supporters um, and uh, encouraged me then to pursue uh, research uh, in vaccines. And, and that's what I ultimately ended up doing is becoming a vaccinologist. So in a, in a uh, very brief, um, sort of way uh, that uh, gives you a, a, an insight into my career. Um, I do not, uh, have not mentioned uh, the support I received from uh, my husband and my daughter uh, who remain tremendous supporters of my career as well. Thank you, Dr. Chatterjee. Um, next, I'd like Dr. Travis to please share with us your story as well. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for inviting me to this symposium. This, this is a very special, and I really consider it quite an honor to be here. So I'm a radiation biologist by training. And um, 
so Rosalind Franklin uh, was a name that I became aware of very early on uh, when I started in science uh, and was, you know, uh, outraged actually by what had happened to her. Mm -hmm. And of course, in you know, radiation biology, radiation damages DNA. So she was in Watson and Crick. These were big figures. Uh, so it's really quite an honor. So thank you very much uh, for inviting me here. And Dr. Jensen, I loved your talk because I think that we don't um, often think about this in terms of the languages that are used in this, uh, uh, you know, as you've talked about. So that was, thank you very much for that. So I, I will just say that my story is uh, the long and winding road. Uh, it had uh, detours and bends and turns. And so I am uh, the first woman in the family to go to college. Uh, and I uh, wanted to go to college very early on. And my parents, my, neither of my parents uh, had a college education, but they were insistent that my sister and I would get one. Um, the, in, the, <laughs> the interesting thing about it is as much as they wanted that, my father said to me, they both said to me, you know, that they wanted me to be a teacher because that way if something happened to my husband, I could always take care of myself. Well, that didn't work very well. I didn't do that. I actually did teach that for a year. And so um, I went to a college close, about 100 miles away, because they didn't want me to go any further away. And it was a you know, small school, nobody except I'm born and raised in Pittsburgh. Uh, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a first generation uh, college student. And uh, I think a lot of things come along with that. You don't know what to expect, et cetera. The other, the other thing that I found, uh, not to go into all the boring details over all these low so many years, uh, is that you, you, you have to, I learned to really follow my gut in some ways. Um, and to, sometimes there would be a bend in the road and you'd look down you know, where you were and where that was going and maybe it wasn't so clear, but it just felt right. And took those, you know, took those leaps, if you will, which were really risks. Um, and I also learned, and this was partially, my father said this to me, is that if you don't ask, you don't, you'll never get anything. They can say yes and they can say no. And so I did not have a storied background in terms of going to the Ivy League schools. I was doing my PhD at the Medical University of South Carolina, and my PhD was in experimental pathology. So I'm basically a radiation pathologist and studied normal tissue injury uh, with, by radiation. And I wanted to go to this lab that was mecca in my field in, in England, right outside, of, uh, right outside of London. And I said, oh, you know, they're never, the other part of the story is I had applied to about 20 uh, postdoc programs and uh, I was refused by 18 of them. And I was talking to my father and he, I told him I really wanted to go there. And he said, Elizabeth, they could say yes and they can say no, but if you don't ask, you'll never get it. So I sent the letter and it came back and it said, yes, we'd love to have you because I, was, I had something they didn't have. I knew about normal tissues and they were studying tumors. Mm -hmm. And I credit that experience in that lab um, with really setting me on the road to where I went from there, which was I went to the NIH for a couple of years. I was recruited there. I was recruited to MD Anderson and uh, my goal was California, but I had a child. And uh, that is part of the story because when you have children, I was a single parent by choice. Um, when you have a child and you're offered you know, a department chair in another city where you don't have much support in any family, um, I made the decision to stay here in Houston at MD Anderson because I realized I could not grow a department and a child, a young child at that point, he was only three years old uh, at the same time. And I've never regretted that decision, but I think it touches a little bit on some of the other things we wanna talk about, you know, how that does influence you. And so I've been here and um, it's been a wonderful career. I think science is, uh, I, I, I can't imagine a better career than being a scientist, quite frankly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Travis. And then Dr. Loberg. Hi, thank you, Heather. 
Um, I also want to thank the rest of the organizers for inviting me to participate in this illustrious panel today. I'm really very excited to be here. Uh, so thank you. Uh, my scientific career started as an undergrad uh, when I uh, took a job or kind of talked myself into a job as a research assistant at one of the neighboring universities. And this is what really opened up the world of research uh, to me. So similar to Dr. Travis, I come from a small town. Uh, at that point in my life, um, a career in science was either a medical physician or you teach. Um, so it was this that taught me um, and kind of opened up that world and possibilities of research as a career. From there, I went to graduate school at the University of Cincinnati, where I earned my PhD in toxicology. Um, had many um, interesting and profound experiences there, and hopefully I'll be able to share some of that during the Q&A. After grad school, I came to Chicago, where I ran a molecular toxicology lab at IIT Research Institute. And it was at this time that I became very active in the Midwest Regional Chapter of Society of Toxicology. And it was through the networking opportunities I had there that I learned of openings at um, Abbott. AbbV later spun off from Abbott, but I have been working with AbbV and Abbott now for 20 years, which is a really long time uh, to be with one company. And the reason, of course, that I've been there so long is because I've had lots of opportunities for growth and development through my career. I started out as a toxicologist running studies then became a project representative where I'm sitting on project teams and deciding which studies to run and then taking the data from those studies and synthesizing that into internal presentations and the documentation that goes to FDA and other health authorities. Um, I had opportunities to work at different R&D sites uh, that AbbV has where I moved and lived in another place and worked there. Uh, I had an opportunity to work in project management for a few years where I managed the project teams. Uh, early in my career, I supported mostly drugs that were being developed for syndications and then uh, moved into oncology. And it was through oncology research that I started working on some of the new emerging technologies. And that's what brought me to my current position in a brand new organization, uh, Emerging Therapeutic Platforms, where I am leading a team of development scientists and discovery scientists. And together, we are developing uh, this new technology that we hope will bring meaningful medicines to patients soon. So, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lobert. Thank you, each of you, for sharing your stories with us. Um, I really am looking forward to this discussion. Um, as Christine just said, if audience members have questions as we engage in dialogue, please put them in the chat. Um, so my first question is, would anyone be willing to speak to your own experience of gender discrimination or marginalization, or potentially even worse? I yes, Dr. Lobert. Yeah. Um... So the, the story that I want to tell is, is really not so much one of um, uh, maybe not gender discrimination so much, but it is about those experiences that we have um, and where we're thrust into a situation in which we are an outsider or uh, perhaps outside the bounds, kind of going back to, to Robin's analysis or in a position where we might feel marginalized. Um, when I was in graduate school, I was doing research on the effects of UV and ionizing radiation on uh, cells from patients with a rare genetic disorder, ataxia telangiectasia. And I had applied for research funding from an organization, AT Children's Project, which was a new nonprofit that was uh, formed uh, by a parent who has um, two children with AT. So um, about a year in, um, the AT Children's Project had their first scientific symposium. And I was invited to present my research at this symposium. 
Uh, it was a very small, so first of all, uh, the founder of the organization, Brad Margus, uh, was a businessman. He was not a scientist, and he ran the organization like a business. Um, this first meeting was very small. There were fewer than 20 people there, and it was called a round table, and we literally sat around a round table. I'd never actually seen a round table before then. Um, but when I first got that invitee list or the attendee list and I looked at the names, I, I, was, I was so shocked. Um, first of all, not only was I the only woman on that list, but I recognized almost all of the other names. These were people whose names are at the end of the list of authors on all the papers that I'd been reading. Um, so not only was I the only woman, I was by far the youngest. I was a graduate student. I hadn't even attended any other scientific symposia at this point in my scientific career. Um, and all of these people were PIs in labs. So I certainly felt uh, completely um, out of my bounds. And my, my advisor, also a woman, um, I went to her and I showed her this list of attendees and said, maybe you should be going to this meeting and not me. And to her credit, she said, no, you applied for the grant, you did the research, and you deserve to go to this meeting and present your work. Um, so it was one of those moments in life where I was uh, um, not feeling very confident, but it certainly taught me a lot. Um, I went to the meeting, I presented my work, I participated in all of the discussions we had on how the organization should spend its money in its next round of research. And it also really changed my opinion or my thought process on uh, the purpose for research and, and what research is all about and what is the end goal of research. I met not only Brad, but one other parent uh, this really humanized the disease that I had only read about until this point in time. And so this was a very um, powerful experience um, in my career. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Would anyone else like to share? So I could give you a myriad of stories because I've been doing this for a long time. And um, it used to be pretty awful <laughs> when I first started. I was frequently uh, the only woman. In fact, when I was in graduate school and was in a radiation physics class, there were only two women in the class and all the rest were men. And this was a time when um, you know, professors could say to women, I don't know why you two are in this class. You're only going to get married and have kids. And you're taking up the space of you know, other, other men. Um, and, and so that's the era in which I started my career. I will tell you that years later, I met this professor at, at a, our professional meeting of our society. And I went over to him and said, I don't know if you remember me, which of course he didn't, uh, but I reminded him what he had said to me and you know, and what I was doing, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> so I got a little bit of, uh, not vindication, but you know, circled back to him and said, this is what you said, and here I am now. And there was some satisfaction in doing that. And I think that um, you know, things, a lot of these things have gone underground. Uh, these, there are still things that aren't said, but are you know, heard or that you know that are being said behind your back. Um, it continues, it can, you know, I mean, it, like I said, there were a myriad, and, and some of them, you know, relatively recently as well. And I think the, particularly when it comes to leadership positions, mm -hmm. uh, this is where we really, uh, we really struggle. Uh, and if you're not, you know, six foot, 180 pounds white male, uh, you're not viewed uh, as a woman, you are not viewed as a leader. Uh, and a, a number of times, you know, um, was a choice of the search committee, but didn't get the position and the 180 pounds, six foot male did. And this has been in maybe the past, you know, certainly uh, maybe 15 years. So things, you know, have gotten better and they've changed slowly, um, but uh, it's still there, but not as rampant as it used to be. And I think in many ways, that's a transition to my next question, unless anyone else 
wanted to participate in the former. Um, it has been documented through research that women faculty are paid less. Um, in fact, um, in the specialties, it is really um, 84 cents on the dollar, right? And so like Dr. Travis just stated, it has gotten better, but we're still seeing the documentation that we are paid less. Furthermore, you know, if we talk about startup packages, it's also been documented that women receive a half of a million dollars less than men, right? This is what our research is stating. And so Dr. Travis, I know you just spoke, but can you speak to the, the disparities in compensation and startup packages for women? So, you know, it exists. So for me, it, let's talk about what we can, how we can fix that. How do we change that? Um, so I know Dr. Chatterjee pretty well. Uh, very well, actually, and uh, you know, she knows that I say, let's stop talking and start doing. And so how do we fix that? We fix that by having startup packages that are standard. Look, if you're hiring somebody in, like, and I'm on a lot of search committees and do this, and we have standard packages. And if we're hiring you in as an assistant professor, for example, on the tenure track, we've brought you in because we, you know, we think you are the best for us. We think we want you here. Why ever would we not pay everybody the same? We start, we have salary benchmarks. Everybody starts at the same salary. salary. It's non-negotiable. And we have fixed packages. And I think it, it also sends a clear message because I think what happens when we have this uh, disparities in packages, in salary, I always tell people, where are you spending your money? That tells me what you value. And if you're paying men more than you're paying women, that means you don't value them. And I think we have to use that kind of language. And I think we have to challenge people to see this and um, you know, recognize it. So I think those are some of the things we can do. The other thing is uh, you, you have to, you know, policies drive behavior. And I'm a firm believer in looking at your policies and changing those that might be, uh, and in this case, it would be putting a policy in place that says, we are gonna pay these packages to these ranks on entry, period, end of story, and it's done. And I think that that works, it has worked here. I'm not saying we're without, not without you know, some issues, uh, but it, and the other thing is to monitor it all the time. You, you can never take your eye off the ball. I wish we could, but we can't. And if you know, if you do an annual salary review and look for you know those who are outside you know the norm or whatever that is, uh, you can fix them right away before you have a huge problem on your hands. Is what happens. And a lot of places don't do that. I mean, we see that in the data. Uh, so you know, but I think I think we have to say these things. We have to put these out there. I agree. Thank you. Heather, if I could just follow up to what Dr. Travis said. Um, I think it's, it's critically important uh, with starting salaries, starting startup packages. And I think it's also important to continue, as Dr. Travis indicated, with the annual review, uh, particularly when there are promotions that occur, for example, because unfortunately what happens um, down the road, and we have data to, to show this, is that you may start out at the same spot, but men negotiate for whatever reasons, multiple different reasons why they are capable and able to do this and allowed to do this, but they negotiate um, salaries and other resources um, often better than women do. And so as time goes on, the women start to, to, to fall behind in terms of uh, both salary and the resources that they are offered. So that's something that as an institution, we have to be mindful of um, going forward so that we don't allow that to occur. Thank you. Thank you, both of you. So, you know, these disparities show up in other areas as well. Um, I know that we are asked to speak, um, awards, things like that, that continue um, to just, just be, um, unequal. 
why do our contributions as women consistently go unrecognized? Yeah, Dr. Lober. Um, I, I think one of the things that uh, often women are not doing as well as men, and um, you know, we've already touched on this a little bit, is speaking for themselves and um, it, Often, uh, you know, the classic phrase that we hear is that women like to let their work speak for them. And I think that um, uh, Robin's analysis kind of brings up a, up a very interesting fact that, you know, we think that we like to have the work speak for us, but yet everything that was written about Rosalind Franklin after her death was not about the work she did. It was about her personality, her work style. It was attributing other things to her. And so I think one of the things that women really need to do, and, and Robin did touch on this, is um, you know, speak for ourselves and bring up our own narrative and make sure that we, we are talking about the kinds of work that we are doing and um, that will you know, also translate into awards and invitations for presentations. Um, as well. Yes. Heather, I, if I could follow up to Dr. Lobuk's uh, comment, um, it's not a direct answer to the question that you posed, but I wanted to bring this up because Dr. Jensen referred to it in her talk, and that was self-promotion. Uh, there's a very nice article, um, short article, written by one of the co-founders of the Executive Leadership and Academic Medicine Program at Drexel, Dr. Paige Morahan, this was written more than 15 years ago that I have used and I have given to many, many people. And it's titled Graceful Self-Promotion. Uh, and it's, it's something that I think um, women need to learn. And that word graceful has been criticized to say, well, do you expect men to be gracefully promoting themselves? And the answer is we live in the society we live in. And there are expectations that people have of women. And I think we have to, within those confines, still be able to promote ourselves and our work uh, in a manner that's effective. Essentially, what we're trying to do is, is um, be effective in promoting ourselves. And in order to do that, if we have to do it in a graceful framework, so be it, uh, is how, look, how I look at it. Thank you, Dr. Chatterjee. Dr. Jensen? Yeah, I, um, I really appreciate this conversation and I um, agree with Dr. Chatterjee, Chatterjee that um, the promotion that women have to do is different than the promotion that men have to do because we live in a different society where although there are a lot of opportunities for women, we still have expectations about what a woman can and can't do and should and shouldn't do and when we go outside those bounds um, we tend to get a negative, uh, a negative feedback in whatever respect that is. And if that's a leadership position, um, Dr. Travis was mentioning this, where you go up for some kind of a, a administrative position or a leader position, and then you're all understood to be um, sort of evaluated under similar criteria, but still there's those underlying criteria about what it is to be a leader who is a woman. Um, and so you have different ability, different persuasive tactics um, that have to be, I always think of, I think it's a quotation about um, Ann Richards, uh, who was a, a, the governor of Texas. And she talked about how Ginger Rogers had to dance the same as Fred Astaire, but she was in she was doing it backwards and in heels. Well, the same thing is happening with these kinds of promotion opportunities where we're saying, you know, promote yourself, tell us what's going on, but you have to do it in a way where no one thinks that you are being bossy or, you know, you're, you're being, you know, all the B words, bossy, bitchy. I, that's all I've got, two B words, but, <laughs> you know, so I think we need to tell women to promote themselves, but also we need to understand that they have different mechanisms for doing that. And it's much more difficult in a lot of ways. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Travis. Yeah, so I, um, I think there are things that women can do 
you know, um, Walt Whitman said, if you've done it, it ain't bragging, but for women, that's dangerous. Uh, but I think there are things that, that women can do. Um, you know, a couple things I tell women is, number, number one, we're always apologizing. You know, when somebody says something, uh, you know, we're always like, oh, I'm sorry, we'll, we'll stop. You know, we have to learn not to do that. The other things we don't we don't take praise. I mean, how many times have you been told you did a great job? I said, oh, it's my team, or oh, it's this, or oh, it's that. Well, yes, you should give credit to team. But I had the president of the university here, cancer, the cancer center, a couple of years ago. You know, I gave a talk, and he said that was great, Liz. And I said, oh, I have a wonderful team. He said, would you just say thank you? He said you are the leader of that team. He said. It, would you just say thank you? I said, uh, thank you. <laughs> so I think sometimes, you know, I don't, I'm a firm believer in not blaming the women because there's nothing wrong with women. Uh, but sometimes uh, we do get in our own way. The other thing is, you know, have other people speak for you. Have, form what I call a posse, people who are close colleagues who know what you do. Um, you know, and be there for each other in a meeting when somebody talks over you. You pick that up as a colleague and you say, that was a great comment and great idea that Dr. Chatterjee just made. We should really do that. Yeah. So I think we have to, just like that, like we've all been saying, we can't do it like the men, but guess what? We can do it. Yeah. Those sister circles, those posses are invaluable. Dr. Chatterjee? Yeah, I, I will tell you, I've been in many, many um, venues with Dr. Travis, and I've, I've seen her actually practice what she's preaching, mm -hmm. which is to stop people and say, don't apologize, you know, accept gracefully the, the recognition you're being given. And I actually call them Liz Travis rules, and I use them myself, Liz. <laughs> so, so it's true. But what she also has done a lot of work in, and I, I think this is an opportune time for her perhaps to talk about, is this notion of sponsorship and um, of promoting women, both men and women, uh, promoting the work that uh, that uh, women do. So Liz, if you would say something about that now. Thank you. Thank you, Archie. Sure. Very briefly, uh, sponsorship is not mentorship. Uh, sponsorship, uh, I view it as uh, succession planning. It's a way to get women and minorities prepared for leadership positions. But not only that, what it does is the big difference is that a sponsor is somebody who has to have power influ and influence and will speak about you when you're not in the room. If there's a, a new committee that's being formed and they think that, you know, Dr. Loberg would be perfect for that, they would say, I think we should give Dr. Loberg a chance at this. And so it's a very different, you know, mentors can be behind the scene and mentors can be sponsors, but sponsors speak for you when you're not there. And this is, it works in the corporate world, actually. This is not my idea. I just uh, stole it from the corporate world and applied it to academic medicine. And I think I have seen it work. I think it does work. Um, and so, and as a mentee or as a protege, so you're not a mentee, you're a protege. You know, your job is to, um, you know, go listen, and when you get the position, or when you're asked to you know, apply for something, you walk through the door, and you perform. You know, because you've been given opportunities. So sponsors provide opportunities that otherwise we don't get. And men are mostly in leadership positions, so we have to rely on them. And so we have to teach them how to be sponsors, which you know, we do that as well. So I want everybody to think about that as a way uh, to, you know, uh, if you're interested in leadership at a time when you are, think about sponsorship and how to do it. And there are lots of papers out there now on this. So thank you, Archie. Thank you. Uh, and I'm curious if we could hear from Dr. Loberg. Um, are, are things better or worse in the commercial sector? Hmm. Um, well, that's a good question. And, and kind of going back to the, the previous discussion as well, I think, um, I agree, it's very important to have a sponsor um, and, and also to have good mentors. Uh, I also think that it is very important to speak up. Uh, so when we are talking to our managers about 
career development discussions, it's important to talk about the kinds of um, opportunities that you might be interested in because they can't read your mind mm -hmm. um, and they don't know what it is that you want for yourself. So you need to find ways to speak about that. So going to uh, your question, Heather, about whether things are, are better in the commercial sector, um, you know, I, I can't really say one way or, or another for sure. I think that probably there are some things that are a little bit better just because there's more um, scrutiny, especially on publicly traded companies. Um, however, I think that, you know, this sort of uh, discrimination um, can occur anywhere. And we do need to be vigilant about this. Uh, we do need to have women in management roles that uh, support other women and that do things like an annual review of salaries to see how things are uh, being um, distributed across um, a group of people and whether that is equitable or not. Um, one thing that I can say at AbbVie is uh, there is a lot of um, talk uh, about diversity and inclusion um, we have gotten, uh, this, our company has gotten a lot of um, external recognition. We've been on Working Mothers um, Top 100 list. Um, we're on Diversity Inc. Top 50 Companies for Diversity, uh, Fortune 100 Best Companies to Work For, and you know a number of other ones as well. Within the company, there are a number of programs available for training. Um, you know, management training, uh, tra lots of different training programs. And we also have employee resource groups such as Women Leaders and um, Black Business uh, Network and several others as well, which provide a more informal um, opportunity for networking. And um, one other thing that uh, AbbVie recently signed on to is something called Paradigm for Parity. This is a coalition of CEOs and other business leaders that have committed to achieving parity in corporate leadership. So in AbbVie, it's um, just under 50% of management positions are women, but in the senior leadership positions, that number drops to 37%. And so by signing on to this Paradigm for Parity, AbV has committed to bringing that number up to 50% um, in five years, I think it is. I don't know exactly the time frame, but um, it's a commitment that has been made from the CEO level and then down. Great. Thank you, Dr. Loberg. Mm -hmm. I think we've all alluded to this, um, but there's no question that the intersectionality of our identities um, impact our work. We've, we've talked about various things. Um, I know of that for me um, as a Native woman, I am really, it's really hard for me to not leave my identities um, at the door. But really in certain spaces, we are all expected to leave parts of us at the door and then walk into those spaces. Um, can each of you speak to the intersection of your identities and how this has impacted your work and career development. And I know some of you have already given examples, but if you would want to expound upon them. Well, I'll start, Heather. Um, you know, I often say this, that, uh, you know, we carry, as, as you say, all of our identities with us. So, you know, you might look at me and, and say, well, there's the Dean of medical school, uh, but I am also, a pediatrician, I'm an infectious disease specialist, um, I'm a mother, I'm a wife, I'm a sister. Uh, we, we have multiple, multiple identities that we carry with us in addition to gender and, 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 and race. Um, and I think in the um, health sciences area, uh, what we have to focus on is what we bring as um, added value through those identities, through those experiences that we have had um, as women, um, as a woman of color myself, those are things that I believe I bring to the table in addition to my expertise in my technical field. 
Thank you, Dr. Chatterjee. Mm, Dr. Travis, please. Oh, Dr. Travis? I mean, sorry. Um, mm -hmm. When I was uh, young and there were very few women in the field and I was blonde and I was always very cognizant of, uh, you know, uh, being uh, one of the very few women being, when I was young, being young. Uh, and so one of the things <laughs> that I insisted on um, was I always wore a suit. I actually have one on today and I've carried that pretty much throughout my career because it, it was kind of like uh, my guard my guardian against all the weapons out there. You know, I figured if I got on the stage and was giving my talk with the suit, maybe they would listen to what I said more, you know, and I think that was, um, you know, one way that I, I kind of tried to manage what I thought the perceptions were, and I think they were the perceptions, uh, and, yet, um, and yet still, uh, you know, be who I am. I'm a woman and I'm, uh, you know, I wouldn't have it any other way. So it's, um, I think it was, you know, when I had children, you know, or one child, I have only one child, but, you know, um, knowing when the pri priority had to be him and knowing when, uh, you know, something else had to be a priority. I mean, I was giving a big talk at a meeting in Canada and they called me, my housekeeper, my nanny called and said he had pneumonia. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I uh, didn't give my talk. I apologized and I told the, and I went home. Mm -hmm because he was then a priority. And I, you know, I never felt that uh, I lost anything by doing things like that. Now, by that time, I was pretty well established. I had a son when I was a professor. Most people don't wait that long. Uh, you know, so I was, I was established. But I think that uh, it's always there. And I think you're always managing it in some way. Thank you. We have about a minute left before we need to launch into the Q&A by our audience. Does anyone? else have anything to share about that last question? Um, yeah, I, I guess I will share a little. Um, so, uh, you know, again, this kind of goes to some, you know, maybe questionable advice. Um, some of us may have been given at various times in our, our careers. Um, uh, at one point in time, I, the advice I was given when preparing for a public presentation was, uh, wear glasses and wear a skirt. Um, I was shocked when I received that advice. And to this day, I still sort of count that as among the worst advice I've ever been given. I don't think that I should have to change my appearance to look smarter. And if I don't feel like wearing a skirt, I don't know why I would. Um, but I've had a lot of time to think about some of this advice too. And and uh, several years ago, one of the managers at work came to me and asked if I would meet with her niece, who was working as a summer student at, at AbV. And she asked me to talk to her niece about careers in science. And during the course of our conversation, this manager said to me, I really want my niece to see that, um, to, that women don't have to dress a certain way or look a certain way to be successful in science. And I thought back to that advice, which might have been given a little differently, um, but I do think that we should be proud of who we are and we should be able to dress in a way that's comfortable, um, wear glasses or contacts, whichever you prefer, um, and, and bring your femininity into the workplace. Um, I think that there are a lot of benefits to that. And, um, you know, I think it's okay to bring your identity into the workplace because um, it's required, actually. You can't leave it at the door. Thank you, Dr. Elliott. Um, thank you, everyone, for uh, participating and answering the questions. Um, the audience, of course, has questions for you now. Dr. Elliott, did you want to say something? Sure. So uh, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Lisa Elliott. I'm a professor of neuroscience and one of the co-organizers. And I, I volunteered to monitor the Q&A box while uh, Heather was moderating the discussion. Um, and there's been a lot of great questions. Um, one of the ones that got the most votes comes from Jennifer Smith. And I think, you know, uh, maybe Dr. Travis can address this because she's asking about the role of women in science is important 
but um, can you speak to the importance of diversity in the field? If the field has advanced, are there ways uh, you can serve as allies to increase the numbers of Black, Latina, and Indigenous women within STEM? Uh, yes, the answer is yes. Um, so I, my office, uh, when we opened this office, it was women faculty programs. And then about four years ago, we took the minority faculty under our umbrella as well. I think that, um, you know, the Scott Page, you know, is the guru on diversity and diversity at the table and that in science, like anywhere else, team science does better with diverse teams than with teams that are homogeneous. Higher publications and higher impact journals, citations are more, et cetera, more patents when you have uh, diverse teams. So diversity is critical. And I think it is up to us that, you know, there's a real difference between what we do, what we have to do for women and what we have to do for minorities. Because number one, there are a lot of women. And so the issue is getting everybody promoted, getting them into leadership positions. Minorities, we don't even have the numbers. The pipeline, you know, the pipeline for women in science and medicine is rich. There's a lot of women in it. Um, for minorities, including minority women, it's a very, it's a very skinny pipeline. I mean, it's hardly, uh, you know, I mean, we just looked at all this and, and it's at about, you know, in terms of faculty and even students, I mean, we're less than 10% that are African Americans and uh, Latinos and others, and others are even less. So I think it's, so the one thing that I learned uh, was you must be intentional. You can't, we cannot leave this to chance because we left it to chance and we can't do that because that hasn't worked. And we have to be intentional with women and we have to be intentional with minorities in terms of getting them in the field. You know, going out and talking to you know, you know, the high school students, bringing them in, showing them what research is, providing opportunities for them to see what you do. Uh, and I think we have to broaden, you know, uh, women have, st there are still challenges, but we have come a long way. And I. I think that um, I feel some responsibility and you know, to kind of give back, not only to women, but to women of color, as well as you know, young men of color as well. And I think, yes, we do have a responsibility to do that. And I think, but the challenge is, the challenge is we need the numbers. You cannot promote who's not in your pipeline. You cannot hire who's not in your pipeline. But we have to be intentional. Go out there and find them, and then provide them the opportunity. Thank you. Um, I, another question that uh, a, a lot of people are wondering about is uh, comes back to this issue of compensation. And um, uh, the problem, at, at least in this country, is that it's a big secret what people get paid. It's a, it's a privacy issue for some reason. It's not that way as I understand it in, in other countries, Scandinavia, etc. So uh, Jennifer Greenwood asks, many times we do not realize we're undercompensated until we move into leadership positions and get a glimpse of what our peers were paid. It's up to managers to level the playing field. How can we hold them accountable to things we are blinded to? I'll take a stab at it, Elise. Um, but mm -hmm. before I, I answer, um, or try to answer that question, I'd just like to follow up on what Liz said with regard to um, removing barriers. And there are many different barriers, but one of the ones that, that I think is, is crucial and critical to address is financial barriers. So uh, people of color have far more uh, difficulties uh, trying to go to graduate school or medical school or other health profession schools because they don't have the financial resources. Um, so I, I think that's something that um, I personally am laser focused on and I think all of us need to pay attention to. There are other barriers, educational gaps, et cetera. I mean, we do need to address those things, but the financial barriers I think are very important. Now to the question of how, how do we hold people accountable? Um, actually, this has been uh, included in many leaders' uh, evaluations to say, what have you done to assure um, equity in the workplace when it comes to salary and other resources? Uh, so that's one way of uh, making sure that um, leaders are held to that standard. Now that's not something that people who are 
um, at a lower level are able to do, but people who are at a higher level. So for example, um, you know, a, a, um, a dean can hold chairs responsible uh, to make sure that uh, there's equity in, in salary. Uh, the dean can be held responsible by uh, whoever uh, he or she reports to, whether that's a chancellor or a president or, or a, a provost. So that's one mechanism I know of, of holding um, the managers, if you will, or the leaders accountable for ensuring equity. Thank you, Dr. Chatterjee. Um, uh, another question uh, comes from Sarah Feed, um, and perhaps this would be directed to Robin. Um, Sarah was struck by the insidiousness of characterizing Franklin as a poor collaborator, when it seems like the people around her might have been difficult for her to collaborate with, i.e. also poor collaborators. Dr. Jensen, do you have any thoughts as to how this type of language can deflect reflection on behavioral norms or something of that nature? It's such a great question because uh, it, it feels like she couldn't win in this situation. Um, and it's also important to note that it's so interesting that they upheld the idea of collaboration as a value when, uh, you know, traditionally what is upheld is the idea of being the self-sufficient person who goes and finds the data and does the work, which is exactly how Rosalind Franklin was characterized in everything. Um, in, in representations of her. Um, and then they said, well, this is not scientific. This is not a scientific value. This is uh, isolationist and sort of all of these sorts of negative things. And then there were all these structural barriers to her being able to collaborate. She wasn't able to go in the physical spaces that men were able to go into, whether that was the lunchroom or the pub or what have you. Um, and then, you know, there was an underlying um, sort of a, I would argue even, and, and Watson goes so far as to say this, there was a sexual undertone when she interacted with him and maybe others, right? And so she was sensitive to that and didn't want to um, play into that because we know that you know, in those kinds of narratives, it's only so long that women will be upheld in the romantic role before they say, oh, well, you're not scientific. Let's get you out of here. So um, it really is a double-edged sword. And I don't think that the answer is um, that women necessarily do something, which is often our message that women have to do something about this. It's structural changes in a lot of cases that have to happen. Let's sit down and figure out what spaces can you not go into and why is does that have to do with breastfeeding does that have to do with you know there's it's probably not going to play out in the same way that it did in the 1950s thank goodness um but you know we have to sit down and, and make structural changes so that people can be in the places they they have to be in the room where it happens right We've, we're all using that that phrase um and that's really important, not only at the level of gender, but also class, also um, race, ethnicity. These are, these are very important issues that if we tell people they have to speak differently in order to make this happen, if we tell people you have to go to medical school and do all of these things, even though no one in your family has done this and you don't have the money and on and on and on, it's not gonna happen because they can't. They're, they're structurally not able to do that. So we need to put into place a system where we can make this happen. I think that might get at the question, but maybe not. No, that's that's great. And I just wanted to um, read a comment from David Baxter. It's not a question, but it it sort of follows up on that. Uh, he said uh, he points out that Rosalind had no issues collaborating with her fellow scientists in Paris. This was an issue generated by King's College and the UK scientific community. So. It, um, what we think of as masculinity and femininity is very much, you know, culturally bound, I think is an important point. Um, it looks like we have time for just one more question. Um, and I think it might be a nice note to end on. Came up in the chat and then it, it uh, came over to the Q&A without a name attached. But the question is, uh, what can males do to help accelerate women in their position, especially in healthcare field, without being overbearing? So I don't know who wants to take a swing at that one. 
I'll, I'll try first, um, please. So mm -hmm. absolutely, you know, I think Dr. Travis referred to this earlier, which is, uh, I say it's like the Marines, you know, we need a few good men. Um, we need more than a few good women, men and women to advance the careers uh, of women as well as um, those who are un underrepresented in medicine and science. Because when we look at who are the people in the positions of power in our fields, it is mostly white men. And it is um, their role really, in, in my opinion, to uh, to advance uh, women and people who are underrepresented because, as Dr. Travis pointed out, the outcomes are better. Ultimately, what do we want? We want better outcomes, right? So uh, it's, it's um, something that uh, everyone needs to, to think about and, and work towards. Uh, it's this notion of allyship and sponsorship, which ultimately will get us uh, where we're trying to go uh, with the work of the men uh, who are not just in positions of power, but even at say the same level that the women are at, but for them to be supportive and, and to speak up and say, uh, you know, we, we need to support our women faculty, our, our underrepresented faculty in order for all of us to do better in the future. I think that, oh, Dr. Travis. I just wanted to say, I think what we can do as women is, yeah, um, when we invite them into you know, our circles, when we invite them into, if you have a women's group, you bring them in, don't treat them like they're you know, a unicorn. Uh, I mean, bring them in, you know, give them a job to do, task them with something, uh, make them feel, you know, feel part of the group. Uh, so I think we can, we can help. Yeah, I hate to say we have to help them, but we have to help them uh, do all this. And I think that, uh, I mean, it's critical. It's, they have to help carry the water. It's just that simple. Uh, and uh, there are ways, you know, there are ways we can help them do that, particularly those of us who are senior in the field. Okay. Well, uh, believe it or not, uh, we've just spent a, two wonderful hours uh, exploring these questions. So uh, we need to let people get on with their evening. But um, I, I just wanted to thank um, our wonderful panel. Uh, and Dr. Kine Keppel for, for moderating it uh, in such a beautiful way, and uh, Dr. Chatterjee and Travis and Loberg for participating, especially Dr. Jensen's fabulous uh, talk, a very different, many of us are familiar with Rosalind Franklin's history, but um, her uh, analysis really gives us a whole new insights and I think ways to think about you know, some of the, these boundaries that we create between uh, different groups of people and professionals. Um, if, uh, if they're still with us, I'd, I'd love to have uh, Dr. Rowe and, and Rosalind Franklin um, unmute their video so we can say goodbye and thank you. And um, I also wanted to, to thank our fabulous committee that uh, helped organize all this. I know it, it seems like doing it virtual would be easier, but but uh, you'd be surprised. <laughs> so um, yes, bravo to uh, my co-chair, Christine Burgess, who's a, a faculty member in the PA department, to uh, Jay Moat and Nicole Ulibri, who truly did uh, the very heavy lifting and incredible coordination for all our participants and panelists. And uh, Bruce Sowers, who's our uh, AVP for Online er Learning and Director of Faculty Development. So thank you so much for uh, your help and, and allowing this all to, to come together. Uh, we're, we're learning on the fly and hope to, uh, to do it again, either in, in for this format or for others. And so before everybody goes, I wanted to just say that uh, July 25th was the 100th birthday of hey. Franklin. But uh, it's just the kickoff for our year-long celebration of uh, her centennial. And uh, I meant to, to hold up, um, maybe you can still see me, uh, the beautiful centennial barista glass coffee mug I'll be sending to all of our participants. So thank you so much for, for, join, for uh, joining us. And to say that we have several more events coming up. This is going to be a year-long a celebration. Uh, you can see some of them up on the screen right now, and I want to draw your attention particularly to Dr. Esther Chu, who will be speaking in December. Uh, Dr. Chu is a real uh, leader on promoting uh, women and, and underrepresented groups in medicine and also uh, very passionate um, 
uh, voice against uh, health disparities, particularly in COVID. And so I think she's going to be addressing both of these issues in her talk on December 10th. And all of these are, are free and open to the public. And you can see several other uh, seminars we have coming up and we'll continue this into 2021. So um, last but not least, we hope to see you at some of these future events. And so uh, let me then just end by thanking our audience uh, for joining us today. Um, from near and far away, we appreciate your support for women in STEM and healthcare and look forward to seeing you at uh, some of these future events. So I hope everybody stays safe and has a lovely evening. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all wonderful panelists. Thank you. Yeah.